All right, you guys, welcome to the Helicopter Podcast. And today is an extremely uh, proud moment for me as I've, I'm hitting 100 episodes. This is, uh, in fact, the 100th episode of the Helicopter Podcast, which uh, has been an incredible journey. Uh, everything about this podcast has become so much more. And I think some of the greatest things in life tend to be that way. You have an expectation going into it thinking, Ah, it's going to be one way. And then it just turns 180 uh, and goes this crazy direction that you never thought of. And that's how it's been. And it's been a big part because of you, the listener, uh, also MHM Publishing. If you're not familiar with MHM, they're the, they're the big dogs behind Vertical Magazine, Valor, Skies, and of course, the Vertical Helicast platform in which the Helicopter Podcast is part of. So I'm just so grateful and man, I have been brewing this guest for a long time. It's been stewing in my head like, man, if I can get Lee for episode 100, my life will be complete. And uh, we've been we've been kind of going back and forth and we nailed it down today. So I'm so excited. I got Heli Pilot Lee joining for the very first time on the 100th episode, the Helicopter Podcast. Lee, how are you? I am great. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor and congratulations on a hundred. That's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those things. I'm, I'm proud of myself because uh, I took like a little break. I did like 12 episodes, I think in the beginning. And then I took a little bit of a hiatus. And then I, I think from like episode 12 to now, I've done an episode every single week. So well over a year, I think we're going on almost two years. Uh, of weekly recordings, well, not quite, but this this uh, next Heli Expo, I think, will kind of mark that two years. So it's it's been awesome. Podcasting is really fun because I get to have great conversations with people like you. Um, but it's also a lot of work. It's t- it takes time to produce and and do all this. And so the fact that uh, the MHM team, my team, everyone's come together. So uh, just feeling grateful about it. So I'm going through your Instagram as I often do. I uh, love your content that you're putting out on social media. And the the first thing that catches my my eye has really nothing to do with helicopters. Uh, it has to do with like this jet pack on your arms and I think on your back. I know that this is not the jet pack podcast, but I have to ask, what is that? Because it looks amazing. <laughs> oh, um, it is amazing. So that what you're seeing is the gravity jet suit. And it's um, at the time it was two engines on each arm and one on your back. And I think they have two on their back now. Uh, but I was actually the very first woman that they trained nice. to get off tether. So uh, I was asked to join their race team and uh, was all excited to go do that. And then COVID happened. So um, so I have not been on it since they, they have since actually started up the race again and it's been super fun. I, I went to the first one that was in Dubai last year and it was super thrilling just to see it in person. And even though like I've done it, but it still looks like this crazy futuristic thing that I can't even believe, like my mind doesn't really understand it. No, uh, it's so incredible. I can't even imagine. I don't know if I would have the kahunas to actually do it. It looks like awesome, but mildly terrifying how much time did it take to get to the point where you're off tether and like legitimately flying around it it really reminds me of the rocketeer which is this movie that i was obsessed with growing up so it's like like a childhood dream to do that but i I think i might be kind of scared well i i like you was uh obsessed with things like that especially as a kid and watching the jetsons growing up and uh or as a as a very young child and uh i figured we'd all be flying around in jetpacks by now but we're not. So I know. Uh, <laughs> so I fly helicopters instead. And I used to tell all my passengers that I'd joke around and be like, yeah, it's the next best thing to a jetpack. 
And uh, and one guy actually said, hey, well, hey, there are jetpacks. And so then I stayed <laughs> up like all night long on YouTube researching and looking and I found uh, jetpack aviation and I went and uh, hounded them until they let me come and train with them. So I did a day with them, two days with them actually. And then I went to Richard Browning and flew the gravity jet suit, did one day of training in the US and then he invited me to come to the UK and I flew I think only one day, it might've been my second day with them that I went off tether. It might've been the third. I can't remember, but. Is it, is it fairly intuitive or is it, is it, it, does it take some time to kind of get the nuance of it? It is very challenging. And I would say that, um, helicopter skills actually help a lot just being able to hover. Um, and then their whole idea of doing this, this race was right up my alley because I used to race border cross on a snowboard. And so when Richard Browning told me that, hey, we're going to get six jetpacks uh, racers together and then fly around over the water and then the last person back to the dock will win. I was like, that's right up my alley. I've been training for that my whole life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, it is fairly intuitive if you're athletic, uh, but it takes a ton of strength. And at the time I was doing handstands every day. In fact, I used to share a lot of yoga and handstands on Instagram before my helicopter stuff. And uh, so I was super strong at the time. And I was like between handstands, flying helicopters and racing board across. I'm like, I'm your girl. So it was kind of like this culmination of all these things I'd done in my life. I would say that, yeah, you'd definitely be the perfect candidate. Well, that's super cool. I love, <laughs> again, just the content that you create is, is awesome. Um, there's a lot of really cool helicopter content on social media, but I don't find it all to be uh, fully responsible all the time. And something that I love about your channel is you have a professional pilot background. You do things really safely. And I think you're promoting the industry really well. Uh, so I love that piece of it. And when people see your content, they're seeing you here and now and flying around. And I think what has probably become the most recognizable helicopter is your 505, the candy cane. <laughs> I, I think honestly, even like non-helicopter people would see that flying over and be like, hey, look, it's Lee. <laughs> um, I, you know, I guess I, you know, that's what we're seeing now and it's incredible stuff. You're doing awesome landings. You're flying in cool areas. You're traveling all around the United States. It, it seems like, but obviously that's today. There's been so much to get you to that point. And we've got to meet a couple of times, but I don't actually know your story. And one of the things I'm super excited to learn today is kind of everything that led up to what you're doing today like you said you you race border cross i know that you were really into yoga uh you owned your own helicopter company uh so i'm just curious like if we just go back to the beginning i'd love to hear just a little bit of your journey not just in helicopters but kind of all the crazy cool adventurous things that you've done in your life you know halsey i really appreciate you saying that because that is one thing <clears throat> that's hard for me sometimes when people people just look at what I'm doing now and think, oh, that's great. You must be spoiled and everything was handed to you. And I'm like, gosh, if you only knew all the things that I did to get to here. So I really appreciate that. Um, and as far as the things that I get to share um, with helicopters, especially coming from a professional helicopter pilot background and actually doing all those things and working in the backcountry has... Um, to get that skill set, it just takes so much work. And you can be a private pilot and do all the training things and go to the mountain courses and do all these things. And that's fantastic. But you really don't grow as a pilot until you do it professionally and you're forced to get out there and figure out how to sling in 50 knot winds and how to deal with very uh, inclement changing weather and making all those decisions. So, um, so I feel very fortunate to have that background. And then now to actually be retired and get to combine those worlds and have a whole lot of fun. Uh, with the skill set and doing things safely. Um, so I guess long story short, um, I was I was racing board across. I had a car accident. I couldn't snowboard anymore. And one of my very best friends, Tracy, who you've talked with before. I did. Uh -huh. She's she is just tangent. She's one of the funniest people I've ever met. <laughs> I, my first phone call with her, it's kind of a pre-interview, <laughs> turned into her interviewing me for like 40 minutes <laughs> in all good way. Uh, and then, yeah, of course I had the podcast with Tracy. So, uh, yeah, she's awesome. She's awesome. Yeah. And so when I was kind of like lost with what I was doing with life and I couldn't snowboard anymore and, and she, we had been really good friends and she, and she moved to Hawaii and she was like, Hey, you should move out here. And I was like, absolutely. I will. 
And I sent my bicycle out there and I showed up two weeks later, and moved in sight unseen and uh, went to a party and ended up talking to some guy that was going to helicopter school. And, and I told Tracy about it and I'm like, I didn't know you could just go to helicopter school. I thought you had to do this all military style. And, uh, and I was too old at that point. I was 30, maybe 31 when I started. And, and so I told Tracy about it. And the next day we both walked into helicopter school. Um, I was waiting tables at the time. So I just waited tables probably about halfway through. I think I spent about $25,000 before I decided to get a loan. And at that point, that was in 2004. It was like, you could get a loan, no problem. Um, borrowed 30 grand and finished school. And then just like put the blinders on and I just, <clears throat> I did the CFI, the CFII, the commercial, the instrument, the, the private, I did backwards there, but um, got all the ratings. And then I got the job as the instructor, worked for um, really only eight months before I got a thousand hours. You were flying a lot. It, it was a lot. It was like, uh, at the time we had a whiteboard for the schedule and I just kept it all open and anybody could walk in and put in their name. And I mean, I was flying from 7 a.m. till 9 p.m. a lot. Uh, and then doing ground school and everything else. In your previous life before helicopters, was that your personality? I mean, someone that's like pushing hard, getting it, just getting the school done and then like working endless hours in order to get to your thousand. Is that just, was that kind of just your MO before you even entered into the helicopter space? I would say that I am willing to do the things I need to do to do the fun stuff that I want to do. Like when I first moved to Squaw Valley, Lake Tahoe to go snowboarding, I worked at 7-Eleven. I'm like, I can get a season pass and, and then work for like, I worked the swing shift. So I did 3 p.m. till 9 p.m. So I knew like everyone coming in, I knew where all the parties were afterwards. And I got my season Perfect. pass to snowboard every day. So like, I'm just willing to put in the work and I, and I, yeah, just make stuff happen. Uh, but I would say that the key there is that I like to play a lot. And so I would always figure out how to like, work minimally to play a lot. And so that's pretty much how, how I got into helicopters too. And so then with helicopter training, people are going out to dinner or going to a party or doing whatever and inviting me. And I'm like, nope, I'm staying home. I'm going to practice flying instruments to Maui and back like for five hours. <laughs> so uh, just like put on the blinders and don't do anything besides what I'm doing. Just totally focused on it. I think that's nice. And I'm glad that you said that someone like you, who's influential in, our community. I think there's a lot of young guys and gals that are getting into flying. I was one of them that figured, okay, I'm going to go to flight school. I'm going to absolutely love it. It's going to be easy. I'm going to fly things. Dunner that, you know, I went pretty much right from high school and I wasn't like a, the world's greatest student because I don't like sitting, you know, for class and whatever. And then you get to flight school and it's like, oh man, there's a, what do you mean ground? What do you mean we're doing ground? <laughs> oh, I have to study? I have homework? You know? And for me, I didn't do a good job at putting the blinders on. In fact, I feel like I did the opposite most of the time. How long did it take you to go from zero to hero? 13 months. Okay, so that's pretty telling. It took me like 26, right? So like double what it took you. It's because, And because I didn't prioritize it. And granted, I was young and dumb. And I had a good time and I don't regret any of that. But if you're listening to the podcast and you're getting into flight school, whether you're 19 or 30 or 31, uh, it's school and you should treat it like that. And in fact, the most successful students that I ever saw or I ever taught were those students that treated it like it was a job. Show up, do your flying, do your ground, study, study, homework, and then do it all again the next day. So I... I appreciate that uh, you were maybe a better role model than I was. Thank you to our sponsor, Vertical Aviation International. Are you ready for the largest vertical aviation show in the world? Verticon, formerly HAI Heli Expo, is coming to Dallas in March. With over 15,000 professionals and 600 companies in attendance, this is an event you don't want to miss. If you're interested in exhibiting, contact sales at verticalavi.org. That's sales at verticalavi.org. See you at Verticon. I like that you say that too, because uh, and, and thank you. Um, you're an amazing role model as well. Uh, and everyone has a different path. And so, um, I, so Tracy and I went through school at the same time. It took her eight years 
But she's like, oh, I'm going to get a dog. And I'm like, don't get a dog that ties you down. You, you have to concentrate. You have to focus. She's like, oh, I'm going to buy a house. Oh, I'm going to, I like this guy. I'm going to have a boyfriend. I'm like, none of those things. Like, get rid of all of it. And so now, I mean, she's married to a pilot as well. She's got a baby. Yep. She's got two dogs, a house. Like, she's the happiest person I know. You guys are kind of yin and yang, though. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what probably makes it work so well. Oh, yeah. I, I love her. Like, I can call her up. And I mean, even if we don't talk for a couple of weeks, we still are like so in tune with each other. She's just hilarious, like you said. And um, she, she just like nothing bothers her. She's always the most positive person. Anyway, yeah, I, can, I can rave about Tracy all day. I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah. I have a cousin like that. And ironically enough, her name is Tracy. She lives in Tennessee and she was just here. She just left today. So it's all, it's kind of funny, but it's like, it's like this positive aura, like all the time, like nothing me. I try to be positive, but I have to go in really intentionally. Like I have to be intentional about being positive all the time. Yeah. Where like my cousin or Tracy, uh, just, they seem so jovial all the time. Like nothing <laughs> rattles them. It's, it's like a superpower that I certainly don't have. I'm jealous. <laughs> right. So as far as going through school, the other thing you said there is that you, you treat it like a job. And I remember one time actually I told Tracy, cause she'd show up and she's all jovial and she'd show up a little bit late. I'm like, Tracy, treat it like a job interview. Like you want that job at the end. So there's going to be like 10 of you all graduating at the same time. There's one job opening for that instructor role. So um, she totally t heard me at that point and totally switched. And she's like, she was early every single day, at least a half an hour early. She'd get her pre-flight done. Just anyway, taking it super, super serious. And, and you're right. It is a job and a job interview. 100%. I mean, I, I've said it countless times on this podcast. The second you start flight school, that's the second you're interviewing. And yeah. all your actions, everything you do, all your interactions, the things you say, everybody's watching. And, yeah. you know, I don't know what episodes or how many you've caught or heard me talk about, but I did everything wrong. I said all the wrong things. I had the <laughs> bad attitude and I somehow still skated by and was able to get that job. But, uh, you know, 100%, if you treat it like, like a job, you show up on time, you're a good person. Those are, that's how you're going to get hired, right? People want to work with that person. Yep. And be prepared to be disappointed. So people ask me like the things to help prepare when they're starting school. I'm just, just know that your instructor is going to leave at some point. You're going to have a maintenance issue. Your check ride is going to get postponed. The, uh, like er everything that can go wrong is going to go wrong. And the way you handle that is like the owner of the school and the, your instructor, they're all watching that. 100%. So, and that is a perfect introduction into the world of helicopters because the only, the only constant is change. Seriously. Yeah. So you, you go through school, you work as a CFI. Uh, did you work as a CFI at the same school you trained at? I did. And there were eight of us that graduated and I got the job. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I nice. prepared to leave, but I, I didn't have to. So It's so funny. I don't know if, uh, if you've noticed this, but it seems like so much of the helicopter available job market is very cyclical, right? It's almost like the stock market. It's ever changing. And when I was in school... I, I graduated high school in 2006. I started flight school shortly thereafter. And from that period, from like 2006 to probably 2010 or even a little bit later, it was like very competitive to get a CFI job anywhere. Yep. And it was competitive to get a tour job anywhere. It was competitive to get an air medical job. And nowadays, I talk to a lot of flight schools and it's like they're, they're begging for people. They need instructors. And then you talk to all these tour companies that never called me back, that left my resume <laughs> on their desk, and they're begging for people. Same with the air medical. So it's just like I came in at a very competitive time when it was so hard to get a job. It sounds like it was similar during that time as well. Yeah, same era. So I, I finished uh, 2004 is when I went through school. 2005, I was an instructor. 2006 was my first 135 job, and that was with Tempsco in Juneau. Um, nice. Yep. So I did three months with those guys and it was such a perfect like entrance into that world of, Hey, I'm flying a new helicopter. I'm in a new place, but we're flying six helicopters together. So it's like having training wheels. And I was able to learn from the lead pilot and there were, we were all first years. 
And there was one, maybe two pilots that had returned. And now I think it's all, um, it's just, it's very, very different. You know, and it's interesting, Alaska flying, even flying tours, whether it's at Temsco, Coastal, whatever it may be, it's like, it's some serious piloting. I don't know, personally, I've actually never even been to Alaska, so I'm going to throw that out there, Lee. Like, if you ever need a co-pilot, <laughs> I've never been to Alaska. I'll pay for my own way. I'd love to come up. That being said, I've had a ton of buddies, Temsco, Coastal, flying tours and telling me, like, you know, flying in very low visibility, uh, you know, really cutting your teeth. Like, Alaska is such a no-joke place to fly helicopters that even doing a quote-unquote easy job like flying tours uh, can be fairly like crazy at times. Was that an experience that you had? Was that similar? That first year with Temsco, it was pretty structured because we're following other pilots. And so like I would never go fly in some of the weather. But then once I did it following someone, I'm like, oh, okay. And then my my world kind of expanded and just understood how to do that safely and how to slow down and how to never, ever lose sight of the ground. Um, and then you're also dealing with legal limits, especially in Juneau, because there's, I mean, the noise abatement there is crazy. You, ha- you can't turn right until you're over a certain building. And then, I mean, it's very, very structured. And then the approaches back into the base is like, you're diving off of this mountain and you're learning how to scrub your speed. It was like, it was really fun. And, and I was able to learn some things there that I still get to use, which I love. Um, but then I went back to Hawaii to fly tours and I'm like taking off from an airport and I'm going out to the volcano and then I'm coming back to the same airport. I'm hot loading and I'm going back doing the same thing and I'm doing the same route every single day. Weather is also pretty tricky there, um, especially on the, the windward side of the big island there. And now I'm the only pilot. So now I am making those decisions. So I was able to take my skill set that I learned from Temsco, bring it to uh, Hilo and be able to slowly move into growing as a pilot. Uh, some people can learn a whole lot faster. I, I was like really happy to start with those, those, those few steps that helped me to get to where I needed to be. Um, yeah, it's so incredible. I mean, those, those first jobs, depending on what you do can be, you know, such lay so much foundation and not even just the 135 jobs. I'll be flying sometimes thinking about, my school days, whether my instructor would be saying something in my ear or I'm saying something to a student, like I'm still building, I'm still flying off that foundation. And I think somewhere that lacks in my overall helicopter foundation is like, I never got to fly in an environment that was like very changing weather, right? I I flew in Oregon where the weather changes, but it was a flight school. And so it was just so conservative with minimums and weather calls. Like it's a raindrop, don't go fly type of situation. <laughs> so you don't really get comfortable flying in any type of weather. And then I went to Texas, which was pretty much like nice weather all the time. You had to kind of run away from storms sometime, but not low visibility. Like it's either foggy or, or clear essentially in Texas. And then I flew Las Vegas. You can guess very sunny all the time. And then I flew Air Medical that was very conservative with all weather calls. So I've actually never been in a situation and I can feel it when I'm flying in an area that visibility is decreasing a little bit or the ceiling is down a little bit. I feel like my level of anxiety is higher than it should be for the given situation, if that Mm -hmm. makes sense, because I just have no experience within that realm Whereas I'll go fly, like I remember at Maverick, there would be those couple weird days where it's like, oh my God, there's a cloud in the Mojave Desert and it would be kind of foggy getting into the the canyon. And all my Alaska buddies, man, they're just going. They're totally fine. And I'm like, are you sure, guys? Are are you sure? (laughs) And they're like, Halsey, you can see like 10 miles. You're fine. You know? And it's just like my level of tolerance was so different, which I think is fine, right? You have to fly to your tolerance, to your comfort to your personal minimum, but it sounds like your foundation was laid very solidly. It's so true. And just like working into being able to do that and to watch your buddies flying uh, in weather that didn't work, that you weren't comfortable with. It's uh, the, the way that I got to that point was I came back to Alaska after flying tours and Hawaii felt like I was losing my skills actually. And so I came back to Alaska and I got into utility flying. So now I'm living out in, man camps in the middle of nowhere and I'm uh, working mineral 
mineral exploration mostly. And I was on a really big uh, contract and it's called Pebble. And it's pretty controversial because it's also at the main headwaters of the best salmon fishing in the world. And it's a massive load of um, gold that is not easy to pull out of the ground. So they would have to use a lot of cyanide and other things to pull it out. But anyway, lots and lots of helicopters on it working on environmental issues. I was counting fish every five days. So then they have a count of how many fish there are then versus how many, if there ever is a spill or something that goes wrong in the future. Um, but I've got all these mentor pilots. So I've got someone that's flying the Huey and I've got somebody that's flying the B3E and I'm in the MD 500. And, um, and like when we come into hot fuel, we'll refuel out in the middle of nowhere. And one of the guys would stand there and he'd have his hand up and I'd have to put my long line into his hand and he's not going to move his hand, like even two inches. Like I have to put it right there. So demanding perfection. And that's the, how I grew the skill. And then putting drills together, obviously, that's all very precise and really, really fun kind of flying. Um, but I got to follow these guys out in the weather. And I'd see, oh, okay, they've slowed down to this. They've gotten down to this altitude. They're like literally going from treetop to treetop. Not that there were trees out there, but learning how to do that safely and um, and still legally. Like you have to get a special VFR to get out of any controlled area. But I mean, most of the flying we were doing out there was under special VFR conditions. And then out into non-controlled air, airspace. And that's the beauty of helicopters too, right? Is you just have so much flexibility. Um, and if you can use it properly, if you can see it and control it properly and be flexible, you can have that large safety margin to get the mission done without being that, you know, in a situation, right? Absolutely. So, again, like what you're doing, Far, I always tell people, I, I was like the white collar flyer. Like, you know, I was one step away from drinking coffee while watching Netflix, you know, uh, you know, flying air medical is the last job. It's autopilots doing everything. You know, I have no, I have no experience with the utility side. Was that intimidating going into, you know, flying tours to then going into an environment where you're expected to drop a, uh, a hook in, in someone's hand. Like what, what was, just talk me through kind of that, some of the challenges of, I would say almost like for me, I know it would be mental. I feel like my mental game would have to be super sharp and I would have to do a lot of self-talk like, Hey bro, you got this. Like <laughs> I know these other guys are watching you and they think you, you're new and you kind of suck, but like, you got this. Like was, what was that just initial experience going in utility? Because I think it's a big leap that a lot of my listeners are, probably hoping to make someday. Oh, it's so true. A lot of self-talk. So uh, my very first long line job was in an R44 and I got carded. I got my 133 card after maybe an hour of slinging around a bowling ball with my, <laughs> my, my trainer that was like, I can't do this stuff, but maybe you can. Here you go. Try to put that bowling ball in this toilet seat. Like, okay, <laughs> bang it around I and try not to hurt him. <laughs> and then I, I was really fortunate. I got sent out to a job, um, Donlin Creek, and I was with some other, again, mentor pilots. And um, and my ground crew had taken on new pilots before. So they, my ground crew actually helped to train me because they're like, all right, Lee, we've got some non-precise stuff for you. That We've got the dunnage. We've got, we need to get some snow off the top of the mountain and bring it down here to stuff into this well that's gone artesian or what have you. Um, and so I had really good ground crew, really good fellow pilots. In fact, one of them is one of my very best friends. Her name is Shelly Saylor. I don't know if you've talked with her ever. No, I don't um, know that name. Okay. She actually, um, she's in New York now, but she's, uh, she took me out. It was funny because she was my student at Mauna Loa. And we went through school together. I was uh, her instructor for a very short period of time. And then we go out to this place and she teaches me how to tow in. And I'm screaming at her like, no, don't get out of the helicopter. She's like, you got it. Just watch the collective as I get out and change the, uh, the pitch <laughs> of the, of the collective as I climb out. And, and, uh, anyway, she was able to show me and then coming into a, um, confined area of how to actually really look and see how to understand where the, if there's a bush here, that your main rotor is going to go over that. But what happens if you shut down? Well, now your blades are going to start drooping. So there's, and then your passengers are going to be picking them up. Make sure they're in front of you. I don't care if the wind is, if you have a tailwind, you want to keep your tail away from your passengers that are walking in, in, in the end of the helicopter um, or to get into the helicopter. And anyway, um, I got to learn slowly and, but 
but I was forced to, like I'm out in the field and I'm learning how to do this stuff and, and they all understand that I'm new. So then I get better and better and better. And then I go and do the bigger job where now I'm the, the bigger helicopter. I'm putting the drills together and I had to just give myself a pep talk. And something that I have done every single day since this is I show up for the, do- the job, first day on the job. And I'm like, just like, oh my God, they're expecting me to be like the lead pilot now. Okay, how do I do this? And I just took a shower that morning and I wrapped my arms around myself and I'm like, you got this. And I just totally, and then I like looked in the mirror, like you got this and went out and, and just, and then I talk in my microphone. The end of a long day of, of slinging my microphone is like wet. I need a new mic muff. <laughs> so I'm like, Come on, Lee, what are you doing? <laughs> Get your nose into the wind. Uh, so yeah, just lots of, lots of shelf talk. Yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, I think the the terms out there like fake it till you make it, and I, I I do say that a lot. So I like the expression, but I think the true meaning to that is essentially, you know, visualizing success, practicing, and and you know, I I actually truly believe that you can practice something without doing it uh, through visualization. You know, I do it a lot, oftentimes, even in business, I will visualize the outcome that I'm hoping to get. Sometimes we'll have a complicated deal, and I'll I'll visualize all the things that could trip me up between now and a successful closing. And I'll already kind of practice how I'm going to mitigate that issue. And I do it with my team. We'll kind of talk through this whole, okay, what's, what fires are we going to have to put out? And so I think it's, you know, I, I think it's, you know, fake it till you make it. But I think being able to show up day one on a utility job like that, know a, that you have the training and the skill to be successful. Um, uh, and, you know, vis- visualizing that success, I think, goes a long way. I really do. You're so right. Yep. And and even switching aircraft, like to get in that aircraft and sit and go through your checklist and touch the buttons, even though you're not going to start it, you're touching everything. And that is so, so key. Yep. And when I'm switching aircrafts, I, I like I talk out loud. I'm like, OK, I'm, I was in a long ranger. I'm now in a jet ranger. I'm in a jet ranger. I'm in a jet ranger. Don't <laughs> modulate this or, or really vice versa and going from the like a jet ranger to a long ranger. Like, you know, don't don't start it like a jet ranger. Like announcing it, talking out loud and just really confirming, you know, I think it goes a long way. So you're flying utility in Alaska. I mean, how many years from starting flight school, going to that party, that infamous, that's like a that's an infamous party. That party <laughs> created at least two helicopter pilots that I'm now friends with. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. From from that party to flying complex utility external load work in Alaska, what what kind of time frame are we talking about there? Well, 2004 is when I started the training, actually late 2003. And then I think I did my first Temsco job 2006. And then utility flying, uh, when I was flying for PRISM, I would call that the first like big big jobs where I was expected to be the, the good experienced pilot. That was 2008. Could have been nine. Yeah. I mean, that's incredible. I mean, that's a, that's a fairly quick path of, of going from learning about that you can even fly helicopters as a career to then flying up in one of the most, arguably probably the most challenging environments uh, and flying utility pretty wild. Uh, one thing I have to ask, and, and honestly, I sometimes go back and forth. I would be curious to hear your opinion on this, but uh, one of the cool things about having the podcast is showcasing cool people doing cool things and safe things in helicopters, specifically women, because I feel like women are very underrepresented in aviation, specifically helicopters. Then sometimes I feel like it's kind of cliche to ask a question like, oh, what was it like being a woman flying in utility? Because then I feel like that's just a stupid question, right? It should be like, well, it's no different than you going to fly utility. But I know I have a lot of listeners that are young females uh, looking and in, getting into aviation. I get a lot of messages, not just from guys, but also girls that are like, hey, I want to learn how to fly. And so I think that like people like you, especially on social media, are having a big impact on that. But I guess going into your career, specifically utility in Alaska, which is probably very male dominated, it sounds like you had another lady pilot there with you. Was there any challenges that, that you had to overcome just because you're female? 
Thank you to our sponsor, Precision Aviation Group. Mission critical operators and fleet managers rely on Precision Aviation Group as a worldwide leading rotor and fixed wing MRO provider. PAG provides tip to tail solutions in four MRO segments, avionics, components, engines, and manufacturing DER services. A single point of contact gives you access to over 150 million in inventory globally, 24 seven. Just call 800-537-2778. Precision Aviation Group. Others sell parts. We sell support. There were, but I just wasn't, it wasn't at the forefront of my mind most of the time. I felt like I am a pilot. I'm out here. And I think I was received that way as well. Um, I did have one of my, one of my bigger clients that I ended up working with a lot when I had my own business tell me that the first time he walked into my office and saw saw me and he's like, all right, I'm here for the job. Where's my pilot? And I'm like, I'm your pilot. And he's like, oh my God. <laughs> um, but then, <laughs> then <what>? I take, <laughs> he didn't tell me that at the time, but then we go out to the helicopter and I go through the safety briefing and he can tell that I'm super experienced and I am there to mitigate every risk and that I know what I'm doing and I'm going to be his point of contact when we're out in the field and he's going to feel safe as I'm handing him something. Plus, when I start long line, long, excuse me, when I start long lining with him and he's receiving the load and I'm handing it to him like a girl, <laughs> he's like, oh, I like this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, so yeah, it's very finesse. <laughs> finesse. Like women make such great utility pilots. Um, and there's just not a lot totally, of us out there. I totally believe that. I Again, I don't have any utility experience, so I can't speak really for uh, men versus women in that arena. But teaching... I had guy and girl students and yeah, girls didn't have the same ego complex that guys brought into the cockpit and they were just very gentle, more gentle on the controls. Uh, mm-hmm. And then there's other things that guys did a little bit better off the bat. You know, it's all kind of a, a give and take, but yeah, I think women have just the touch, the finesse, and at least they don't have the outward ego. You know, I used to have like this extreme ego of like, how can I not do this right now? And it's like, well, cause I've never done it before. You know, it's like, of course right. I can't do it. <laughs> right. And so I really didn't have have an issue being a woman in that utility world. Um, but where I see it now, it's funny, is because now it's me and my boyfriend that fly around together. And he is also a helicopter pilot. Granted, he was a private helicopter pilot when I met him. So I've basically trained him everything. And when we're flying together, I'm the instructor. I'm the one that's making sure. And if it's a technical landing or bad weather, I mean, I'm the one in charge. <laughs> so, but we meet people and they're like, oh, and and they'll be talking to him and they will ask him a question and then I will answer the question. And then they just don't understand that I'm, they're like, oh, you're a pilot too. I'm like, well, I, I am the pilot. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm Heli Pilot Lee. Come on. <laughs> I mean, granted, Mike is a wonderful pilot and, um, and it, it's interesting and it used to offend me until I realized it's not, it's not really sexism. What's there, why that's happening. It is expectation bias. So if you look 100%. at the numbers, they are, I mean, most of a couple is going to be a man and a woman that the man is usually the pilot, 95%. Hundred, hundred, are, yeah. Like, I don't know what the statistic would be of like either dating or married couples that are flying in an aircraft together, but I would say like 99% of the time, the guy is the pilot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I only know a few. Kate Page, she's another one. Her husband's not yeah. a pilot and they just... People don't understand when they're talking. It just doesn't compute. Uh, but, but I mean, I think that's one of the cool things about your platform now um, is the fact that people can see that you are the pilot, not just any pilot, but you're truly a badass pilot doing some really <laughs> cool things with vast amount of experience. And so hopefully you're helping kind of change the narrative. I could see it being really frustrating to be like, hey, look, I'm, at, you know, Mike's <laughs> cool, but hey, look, I'm the pilot. Like, you know, that would be, you know, that would definitely erg me a little bit too. But uh, but again, I think what you're doing, I think even, man, I've had so many cool girls on the podcast, girls flying Chinooks and doing cool utility stuff, flying Blackhawk helicopters in the military, you owning your own helicopter business and, you know, doing all this cool utility and things like that. So I, I, I hope the narrative is changing. And I think it is. I think slowly, uh, like back when you and I, uh, we're learning how to fly. 
it was like this whole big thing about, oh my God, you can be a civilian helicopter pilot. You don't have to go to the military. That was like the aha back then. That's done. I think for the most part, I think people know that now. I think the new aha is for young females that want to get into aviation. I really do. I think that now with Instagram and Facebook and podcasts and social media, it's just now given, uh, you know, given, oh, wow, that person looks more like me, right? Uh, this idea. And so I, I hope that that's helping. And I think it's moving the needle. Um, so good on you for that. Has that been any weird pressure for you to like be that role model? I'm sure you get a lot of messages from a lot of people, guys and girls. So when I was going through school, I didn't know any helicopter pilots. So I didn't really have a mentor to talk to, ask questions. And so I really do uh, put myself out there for anybody. And I get a lot of messages. People ask, hey, I'm thinking about going to helicopter school. What can you tell me about this or that? Or um, thinking about doing this type of flying. So I will take time. And usually I'll just say, hey, give me a, give me a, a phone call. And let's just sit down and talk because I've got to banter back and forth to understand what stage yeah. you are. I don't want to waste my time if you're just like, oh, I'm going to either be an actress or a helicopter pilot. I don't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I've had a few of those. Uh -huh. um, but to be able to help guide someone and and be able to tell them the, the pros and the cons. And, uh, you know, there's it's a really, really fun career for a lot of us, but it uh, doesn't work for everybody. So. Yeah, it's it's a tough career. You know, I think I love when I talk to people, man, I give them the good, the bad, the ugly from my experience. Mm -hmm. And my experience is wildly different than than your experience. Speaking of which, just in the interest of time, so you're flying utility up in Alaska, you're really progressing. When is this moment that you have this silly idea of, hey, I'm <laughs> gonna start a helicopter company? Honestly, it was an accidental company and it's just the craziest thing because I met two guys that were both private airplane or private pilots and they wanted to fly and buy a helicopter. And so uh, the three of us went in on it and I said, well, why don't you let me see if I can make some money with this thing? And next thing you know, I was like, you guys can't fly the helicopter this weekend because I don't. I need the hours for this job. I've got this job. Like everything just started happening. And at the end of that season, I was like, well, we should take those profits and buy another helicopter. And each year we just did that. We just kept on going. And each year we thought, well, now we'll have enough helicopters that you can actually go and practice and have some fun with your helicopter. Uh, well, it took a decade and we finally just sold the whole business. And now we have a helicopter to play with. I love that. Yeah. That's incredible. It's, it's funny, um, how things really happen like that. You know, you, again, you start with one expectation and it turns into something else. What I, for our listeners who may not be familiar, first off, what was the name of the business? What were the early days of that business look like? What jobs were you doing? And then over time, what did that business turn into? Uh, so it was, it was called BS Helicopters Vertical Solutions and we started with one used R44 and uh, the jobs I was doing was mostly telecommunications. So here I'm in Valdez, Alaska, this tiny little like 2,500 people town. And the company that I had worked with when I was working for other companies that was doing all of this work on the cell phone sites, they needed to upgrade. They're like, oh, you're local Valdez? Well, we'll use you all summer. So I just like helped them build and, and update all these cell phone sites throughout the sound. And, uh, and that really was the main, the majority of our work um, for the first few years. So we did that. We did geology. Uh, we, we ended up with three R44s and R66 and an A-star, a B3, I mean a B2, um, AS350 B2. I loved that machine. And so we, and then we also did tours. So people that are coming in on uh, bus trips, we did a lot of glacier tours for them and walk-in tours. Um, but we did... Uh, search and rescue worked with the fire department. In fact, one of them called me just the other night and they're like, oh, this is Lee. Sorry. I thought I was calling VS. We've sold the company <laughs> since. He's like, but I had your number there. So I was like, I'm available. So let's go do You're it. You're my go-to. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I mean, all kinds of jobs in Alaska that you just can't even fathom, including um, NASA. They were actually JPL. They were working on a, uh, a robot that they want to send to Europa and some of the other icy moons of Jupiter. And they have to practice driving it around on the ice. So I'm slinging it around the, the glacier for them. $2 million robot. <laughs> Love that. Uh, yep. And then uh, like a Chinese scientist that came to town and they wanted to pay in cash and they wanted to put in a, 
uh, weather station up in one of the glaciers. Um, and they, they're counting out like $12,000 of cash to pay me. I'm like, this is just, just interesting. Um, an old miner will come in with his little bag and say, Hey, can you drop me off up there? I'll pay you in gold afterwards. Uh, just like random, but a lot of Coast Guard stuff, uh, geology, flying the USGS around. I call them rock doctors because they're all, um, they all have their masters. Really fun jobs. Um, the heli skiing. Um, I mean, yeah, I just I can't even name all the everything. crazy jobs. You guys, yeah, I everything. Mean, it's one of the, when you're when you're moving the NASA robot around the ice. It's one of those moments where you're probably like, oh my god, I'd never imagine I would be doing this. You know, I've had I've had a couple of helicopter experiences. Uh, that I'm like, I had no idea this was even a thing, right? And so that's uh, I think one of the the cool things about helicopters is kind of the oddball one off missions that you'll do every once in a while. Like what what was that? I'm curious to hear uh, from your perspective. Obviously, with my helicopter sales business helicopter um shameless plug uh we're dealing with owners operators constantly right and so i don't own a, a helicopter but i've seen you know what ownership can look and feel like i've had some kind of past experience in a 44 myself but what was that transition like for you going from pilot to now pilot operator someone that was responsible for scheduling maintenance and ordering parts and you know, I'm guessing in the earlier years you had like pilot Lee, you know, director of maintenance Lee, chief pilot Lee. Like, what was that like in those early years? And what were some of the fumbles? Yeah. It was definitely a learning process for sure. Um, I'm super fortunate that both of my partners, we all had different things that we were good at. So I was really good at the day to day operations and the flying. Uh, Mike was really good at figuring out the contracts, getting us the, on the OAS so we could go do fire contracts and, and other things. Um, and Douglas, he is our maintenance guy. So luckily for me, I mean, it's a lot. I don't know how one person handles all of that because uh, even just as a single ownership, it's there's so much to do. Um, so I understand why there's companies in place that do manage your machines for you. But uh, so Douglas took took care of maintenance, coordinating and getting in the right AMPs. Um, Mike was paperwork and the house day-to-day operations. So, I mean, but the first, like sending out a bill and figuring out how to work QuickBooks. Oh my gosh. I'm like, I remember sitting on the floor with Mike and I'm just like handwriting stuff and then like Googling, okay, how does this work? How do we do this? Yeah. yeah. Paying quarterly taxes. Like, what is that? <laughs> I don't want to do that. Right. I think it's what people don't lot. understand about running a business, it's like, you have the primary business and that's usually good businesses are started from, from something that you're passionate about, you know, in your case, helicopters. Um, in my case, helicopters as well, just a little bit of a different part of the industry. But what you soon find out that the business is so much more and it's nothing about anything that you're interested in, right? It's about accounting and paying this invoice and getting, sending out an invoice to get paid. Getting paid is super important. Not always super intuitive when you first started a business, right? Uh, paying taxes. You know, I read a statistic recently that most small businesses fail within two to three years because of the unknown tax liability. You know, mm. so you're making all this money and you're spending all this money and you're not setting any aside for Uncle Sam. You know, so it's just, I always, I'm so impressed. Anyone that has a business, small, medium, or large it's so hard to do. And I have to say, Lee, I think owning a helicopter company has to be probably one of the hardest businesses that can exist. Agreed. Absolutely. It, <laughs> it is stressful. Helicopters are, uh, helicopters are expensive. They're, uh, they're finicky. It, it, at times, heartbreaking, really. Uh, you know, break, breaking down at the worst times. I mean, uh, I'm guessing you had some certainly some big highs and some lows in, in running that business. This podcast is brought to you by Celicopter. Tired of listings that go nowhere? Exhausted by tire kickers who waste your time? Don't sell your helicopter alone. Celicopter handles the entire process from start to finish. So if your helicopter is sat too long waiting for a buyer, contact the team at Celicopter today for your complimentary market valuation. Call 1 855 Celicopter, 1 855 735 5226, or 
Email sales at Silicopter.com. Silicopter. List it. Sell it. Done. Yeah, absolutely. And, and everything is very complicated being so um, remote. So luckily, Valdez, we are on the road system. But hey, my entire fleet had floats on it. And so every inspection of the floats, every time you pop those, you, you got to send the bottle out. Well, now the bottle has to go ground because it's hazmat. And so it takes like three months to get it back. The doors, if the door breaks on a Robinson, you can't fix it. You have to send it to Robinson. So we're down for three months without a door. That's why I'm like a stickler. I, I, I train everyone so precisely on how to operate the doors. And I don't let any anyone that's not trained touch a door. <laughs> Very smart. Uh, yeah, doors so. doors can be complicated. We had we had jettison door issues at Maverick when I was flying there. You know, tell the passengers when you land, hey, don't don't open the door. I'll open the door, and don't pull that little orange knob down there. That's not <laughs> a handle. If you pull that, the whole door is going to go. And at least once a month, someone was pulling the orange handle. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. I, and so if I had an interpreter, let's say we're doing a group tour of uh, some Asian folks that don't speak a word of English and a one person, I, I will, I'll go over the, the proper 135 stuff, the legal stuff, but I'll say, and don't touch the doors. And then they'll, they'll say it to the, to everyone. And then, and I'll say one more thing and do not touch your door. And like, I'll do it three times. <laughs> yeah. I would so, reiterate so. the doors yeah. and the six sack. Oh Yeah. Luckily in Alaska, people like Hawaii, I used to have people would get sick all the time. But in Alaska, you're usually looking up. You've got mountains or or bears or things up and it's cooler. The temperature is cooler and very rarely do people get that sick. That helps. But in Hawaii, people every in day, Vegas were getting sick all the time, especially in the yeah. spring. It was real bumpy. Mm. And yeah, people it was hot, uncomfortable. You know, they're Move all pissed the off. microphone. Like, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Move it's the like microphone. I would just tell people, I'm like, look. If you feel like you're going to throw up, it's like 99.9% .9 that you're going to throw up. So just grab the bag. There's no shame. Okay? The shame is when you throw up all over the cockpit. That's a bad that's a bad deal. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, go in the bag and I was I was probably like 75 25. 25% of the time they didn't they didn't hit the bag. And now you <laughs> got a mess. You're cleaning up barf after. My good yeah. buddy Tony had a guy behind him all over. Oh. He had to go home. He he literally was contemplating throwing away his $1,000 Bose headset because he's like, this is ruined. I can never wear this again. And I'm like, Tony, go clean it. Don't throw away <laughs> your $1,000 <laughs> headset. I was lucky. I, I had my workout clothes and I didn't work out. So he was able to go and at least change and drive home in that. But um Running the business, what what do you think is the kind of the most proud thing about, um, you know, starting that business and running it for successfully for so long? Uh, I would say our safety record was amazing. Um, being able to train new pilots, I brought in thousand hour flight instructors and trained them how to go out and deal with very inclement weather and learn how to long line. Um, seeing some of the guys and gals that I've trained throughout the years and what they're doing now is I'm super proud of. Someone's out flying a K-Max, someone's out flying a Chinook, someone's out doing that, just all kinds of really cool, interesting jobs. So I got to be kind of the shoe in, the door into utility flying for quite a few people. Yeah, I absolutely love that. It's so cool. Um, and it's great because not a lot of operators will actually, uh, you know, take someone that's just hitting that thousand hour mark. But I would actually argue that it's a great idea because then you're getting to train that pilot, you know, uh, from from your foundation, from how you want things to be done. Uh, because everyone has a little bit of a different expectation. People have different techniques that you should use or want to use for that type of job or that type of mission. And so I think it was probably a wise decision to do that. Um, I started the podcast by saying that people just get to see the outcome of what you're doing now. Uh, and I feel like it's we're already coming up on an hour, which is crazy. There's been so much. So I don't even know if we did you full justice by by really giving people the full s scope, but I would be remiss in not talking about your presence now online and social media and the videos that you're doing and your popularity, your following. <laughs> so obviously you, you sell your business. Truly, in my opinion, seems like you're. it's like the American dream, right? Like you did your thing, you worked your butt off, 
you started a company, you took all that extreme crazy risk of running a company, let alone a freaking helicopter company. <laughs> and now you're getting to really like uh, reap the rewards of that, uh, that path. Uh, having your own aircraft, a beautiful candy cane 505 flying all over the country in Alaska. I'm guessing the flying part was always kind of in the retirement plans, but was this whole social media thing, did that just kind of happen organically? Totally. I mean, it actually started for me when I was working on a lot of the cell phone sites and I'm spending three, four hours out there in the middle of nowhere with a beautiful yoga platform where I've landed the helicopter and I started doing yoga pictures. So I would take my camera and I would just record myself doing yoga. And so anyway, I got really into social media then. It was my creative outlet and, um, and it was also a great form of exercise. And so I don't even post on that account anymore just because uh, yoga is online these days has changed and it's not fun for me anymore. I kind of just do things till they're fun. But then I got into sharing the real life stuff of what I'm doing, flying helicopters. And it's, it's my creative outlet. I love doing it. Uh, with my yoga account, I started to monetize and it got stressful. So this, I'm like, no, I don't sell things. I just share with no agenda except to share the joys of aviation, to... Um, share the art of it, of how to present it. And then I love to be able to share little tidbits of things that I've learned throughout the years, mistakes I've made that now I have a habit that I do it this way now, and this is why. And so I, I really like to share those things. And that's probably the most uh, rewarding when I hear back from someone that like, hey, I saw that and I'm now training my pilots on how to, how to land off airport by looking down at their skid or just those little details. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I find that your content can, can be consumed by someone that has really no interest in helicopters, right? Someone that's just scrolling through and somehow the algorithm is like, oh, you should see a <laughs> helicopter video. You know, I, I'm guessing people just love seeing that because it's so fun. But then people like myself who have been professional helicopter pilots or people that are learning how to fly, you know, people can take so much from the videos. And I think that that's a really neat part. I, I think social media is toxic in a lot of ways. Uh, I think specifically in helicopters, a lot of the big online Facebook pages and things like that, it's like horrible. And it's mm -hmm. like, what the heck, people? Like, we're just a, not a great group of people, it seems <laughs> like sometimes. I, I don't know what the deal is. But uh, so to have influencer accounts that are doing the right things, being positive for the industry, Doing things safely, um, you know, I have some concerns about other, you know, personalities sometimes that, you know, haven't had the background, haven't had the experience that you have. Uh, you know, you, you're bringing in a, a, essentially a lifetime now of helicopter experience into creating these videos. And so, uh, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you're doing it that way. Uh, something super cool that's kind of relevant right now. Uh, is uh, I've seen you kind of cheerleading and posting. I know that you're in Alaska mm -hmm. right now waiting for a weather window, but I think because of like helicopter influencers like yourself, Garrett Mitchell, this whole North Carolina thing has been incredible. Have you ever seen anything like this? It's just tragic and I can't wrap my head around it. I can't understand what's going on and why everything is happening so slowly uh, but it's so inspiring to see all the private helicopters out there just doing their absolute very best and coming together and and creating an organization that so now they've got someone that is actually like telling everybody where to go and just staying organized with it because that's really the the big thing you don't want a bunch of people in there flying around nobody has vetted them they don't know their skill sets so to have it organized is just to sit back and watch that and and I try to sift through what I'm seeing online to get through the BS and and, and only share the real interesting things that are truth. <clears throat> like every part of my being wants to be there helping. Like that's what I do. I love to be able to help anybody. Um, so I'd love to be there. Absolutely. But yeah, can't. And so I'm just doing my part in sharing what I can and helping people to come together and say, well, Hey, I want to, I've got a helicopter and I've got time. I, I'm going to go down there. Who should I talk to? I'm like, well, these are the things that I've seen so far. So yeah. Yeah. It's been incredible. It's, uh, all the things that I was just saying about feeling like sometimes the industry is a little bit toxic is this is a bit of an eye opener of, of not only our industry doing really awesome things, but just people coming together to help people. Obviously very, you know, 
this de- device, you know, very, everyone's always angry. It seems like, right. And you know, the, there's the left and the right and this and that this moment is a horrible disaster. And it's going to, it's the, the end result is a lot of people lost their lives, but the other end result is that a lot of private citizens, Americans came together to do something that's like unprecedented. And, you know, I don't know the nuances of the government, not super happy with the response right now of what I'm seeing with FEMA and everything else. Uh, so good on the local, uh, you know, operators in the Southeast over there and the guys and the gals that are going out and, and making it happen. Uh, it's been pretty incredible. Um, well, Lee, we did it. We did the helicopter podcast. What do you think? <laughs> and we didn't even talk about the candy cane yet. <laughs> we didn't talk about the candy cane. What the heck? Let's talk about the candy cane real oh. fast. So, the I is, I mean, can't we just say that your helicopter is maybe the most recognizable helicopter in the world now? It's pretty recognizable, and I absolutely love it. I love to be able to fly over and have people send me pictures like, "Hey, we saw you," or to land and have someone like drive in and say, "Hey, I I saw that from across the parking lot," and then I'll take people for flights or I'll give them hats or, um, yeah, we we bought the Bell five hundred five brand new in two thousand one and flew it all over from. Uh, Niagara Falls down to Dominican Republic and through the Hudson Corridor. And I'm just like love exploring by helicopter, the whole North America and sharing it with as many people as we can. Oh, it's absolutely incredible. Uh, what was your reasoning and choice uh, of, of picking up the 505? What was the process like in choosing that that was going to be the right platform for you guys? You know, we test drove, test drove, test flew the Bell 505 five times, I think, before we saw, before we actually bought one. And we were hoping to buy one for the business, but then since sold the business, uh, it really, it works out great as a personal machine. Um, so nice. It's so fun to fly. It's got all the bells and whistles. It's got, uh, the G 1000. So, I mean, I feel almost like I'm losing my skills or getting a little bit lazy. Cause I can see where all my traffic is. I know exactly where my wind is. Um, hey, it's okay. <laughs> You've, you, you don't got to prove anything anymore. <laughs> I go out and fly the, the 44 every once in a while and I'll take the GPS down so I can put a camera in there. I'm like, wait, I don't have a ground speed. I have to figure out where my wind is by actually like looking and figuring it out. <laughs> yeah, so. nothing against Robinson. Big fan of Robinson. But I do sometimes see your videos of the 44 and I'm like, oh, I wonder if she's bummed. Because <laughs> it's like switching from a larger helicopter and then going back is always like a little bit challenging. Again, nothing against the R44 though. But, but honestly, for me, it is like I love the 44 and I call it my freedom machine because I don't need anybody's help to pull it out of the hangar. It's super maneuverable. Um, it's super cheap to operate, relatively so. And uh, it's just it's a lot of fun. I love the 44. I think um, the 44 is great. What what do you this will be our last topic just because I was talking a little smack about the 44. I got to build it back up now. <laughs> I, I truly do love the Robinson product. Uh, so a lot of my hours are in Robinson helicopters. I think that they're fantastic training platform. Someone like you that supports the, the, the R44 and someone that's has extensive background in owning and operating and using the R44 for a mission. What would you say to the people that naysay the R44? They don't have any experience in them. It's, it is the weirdest thing to, for me to see these little keyboard warriors that get on the, and they start talking smack about this machine that they have no idea. Uh, I would say that Frank Robinson, he single-handedly changed the industry. Like that's how you and I went through helicopter school. We didn't go 100%. military. Only, There's no way that we could have done this. Yeah. The R-22 really was a game changer for the industry. And that is why there are helicopters now. And these helicopters are out saving people. So um, they're, there are definitely, it's the cheapest way to get into helicopters with an R44, well, R22, but mostly R44 as a private owner. And so you do have a lot of um, novice pilots flying them. And I would I would say that watch out for the pilots. It's not the helicopter, it's the pilots. 100%. No matter what they're flying. Yeah, no, it's 100% yeah. true. In fact, uh, if you're listening, you can check out my recent YouTube video, uh, I attended the Robinson helicopter safety course for the R66. You can go on the vertical YouTube page and check it out. Going to the safety course was super fun. And it's a good reminder of for any helicopter, not just Robinson, but 90 plus percent of the time, if you fly the aircraft within the limitations of that machine, you're going to be okay. 
It's when you start going outside of the envelope, now you're a test pilot and you're not guaranteed, you know, that it's going to be okay. So, you know, that's always been my thing. I agree with you. It's, it's so funny. The Robinson hate comes from uh, a large demographic of people that have never flown in the Robinson. Uh, maybe, maybe some previous military folks that were, you know, flying in Blackhawks. And yeah, of course, like the Blackhawk is a superior airframe to the R-22. I'm not going to argue that, but it's different, completely different night and day mission different. So uh, yeah, good insight, Lee. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. It's so fun. Uh, I feel like I, I know you and, and I, it's kind of like, you know, cause I get to see your, your journey and, and what you're doing uh, all the time. And, you know, I just, again, thank you so much for the content that you put out there. I think it's really positive for the industry. And I think that that's important. Uh, I know coming on the podcast uh, is, is, uh, is <laughs> a little bit scary too. So for any of my guests, I just always appreciate anyone that's willing to come and talk with me. And for episode 100, I, I don't think I could be luckier in having uh, Lee on. So uh, if you're not following Lee, it's Heli Pilot Lee. Uh, on Instagram, such fun content. She's not, yeah, she said it first, she's not monetizing. It's just about sharing her life experience. And I think that's probably what makes it magical uh, because it's just organic and you're just out there legitimately doing what you love. So thank you so much, Lee, for coming on and, and making number 100 so special for me. Thank you so much, Halsey. It's been a blast. There's so much more that I could say. I know. Well, <laughs> hey, guess crazy. what? You, what I've learned in media, Lee, is you got to always, you know, you got to have a little cliffhanger, keep people wanting more. <laughs> so maybe for episode 200, you'll come back and we can talk more about what you've been up to and what you've been doing. Actually, maybe, I, I don't know if you plan on going to Verticon this year, the first ever Verticon, but, you know, maybe I could get lucky enough to do an in, uh, in-person podcast with you. So I think we should definitely do this again. I know that you have so much to give to this industry just based on your experience. So uh, to our listeners, uh, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as, as much as I had uh, in recording it. And again, thank you so much for supporting the Helicopter Podcast. 100 episodes, all thanks to you guys. Uh, you can check out my Instagram page. It's Heli Halsey. It's my new page. Uh, but you can also get a hold of me of the Helicopter Podcast and Helicopter as well. Lee, thanks again. Thanks, Halsey. Thank you to our sponsor, Vertical Aviation International. Are you ready for the largest vertical aviation show in the world? Verticon, formerly HAI Heli Expo, is coming to Dallas in March. With over 15,000 professionals and 600 companies in attendance, this is an event you don't want to miss. If you're interested in exhibiting, contact sales at verticalavi.org. That's sales at verticalavi.org. See you at Verticon. Thank you to our sponsor, Precision Aviation Group. Mission critical operators and fleet managers rely on Precision Aviation Group as a worldwide leading rotor and fixed wing MRO provider. PAG provides tip to tail solutions in four MRO segments, avionics, components, engines, and manufacturing DER services. A single point of contact gives you access to over 150 million in inventory globally, 24 seven. Just call 800-537-2778. Precision Aviation Group. Others sell parts. We sell support. This podcast is brought to you by Cellicopter. Tired of listings that go nowhere? Exhausted by tire kickers who waste your time? Don't sell your helicopter alone. Cellicopter handles the entire process from start to finish. So, if your helicopter is sat too long, waiting for a buyer, contact the team at Cellicopter today for your complimentary market valuation, call 1 855 Cellicopter, 1 855 735 5226, or email sales at cellicopter.com. Cellicopter, list it, sell it, done.